Look at that. Hold on, sorry, I gotta have a little snack. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to my home kitchen. This week's genius recipe is for an update on a classic pumpkin bread with a few ingredient switcheroos that give it a fluffier crumb, deeper flavors, and keep it from going stale on you for days. The wonder bread, pumpkin bread. The wonder bread. <laughs> This recipe comes from Nicole Rucker, who is the owner of Fat and Flour, which she calls a tiny pie shop inside of Grand Central Market in LA. But this recipe actually comes from her time as the general manager and pastry chef at Jelena Restaurant, as well as the Jelena Cookbook. If you like the sound of that so far, and you want more genius recipes from people like Nicole flying at you every couple weeks, as well as all the other videos that Food52 is doing, please hit like and subscribe and we will be very happy. So the first thing we have to do is get these squashes in the oven. Here I have a tiny little kabocha squash, which is what this recipe calls for. And I also have a tiny little red curry squash, which Nicole told me is something that she uses interchangeably with kabocha squash. And I needed both because I literally bought the last four squashes of these varieties at the grocery store yesterday. So all you have to do is carefully, very carefully, cut them in half, which I will do silently now. <laughs> there we go. Okay. There. Now we just gotta scoop the seeds out. And a lot of people will tell you but you can roast these seeds and have them as a snack. And don't you dare throw them away. And I'm not gonna tell you that because I am not convinced it's worth it. This might be controversial, but by the time you, well, at least for me, by the time I clean all the guts off of the seeds, wash them off, pat them dry, pull them off of the towel that I've patted them dry with, and then roast them, often burning them, also currently, there are probably half a dozen uh, kabocha seeds still burning in the floor of my oven. So it doesn't smell great here right now. Anyways. It's really about the seeds. It's, <laughs> it is about the seeds because then you get to snack on them and I just don't think they're that great. Like they're a little chewy. I don't know. So please, if you have other advice, tell me otherwise. You have other better recipes. I just baked mine alongside my squash yesterday and with some olive oil and salt, just not that good. <laughs> Emptied squash. You can see kabocha has this amazing dark orange flesh. It's very dry. You'll see when we get to pureeing, it's very dry and creamy. Red curry is pretty similar. Drizzling with a little olive oil. Those need to roast. In the meantime, here is my conversation with Nicole and I will meet you back here and we'll finish making the batter. Hi, Nicole. Hi. Can you just tell us the story behind this genius cake? The original recipe is from the Tartine pastry book and it's a pumpkin cake that's oil-based, a pumpkin tea cake. Um, and it's really wonderful and it's a, a perfect recipe in itself. It's so good. Um, but we just had to adapt it and it uses uh, fresh farmer's market kabocha in place of traditional canned pumpkin. Um, that is because the kabocha was the pumpkin of choice, I think, for the Jelena group. The original recipe for the cake has oil in it, but it uses sunflower oil or safflower oil. And um, those oils were not really available at work, so I reached for olive oil to give it some extra flavor instead of going for something like grapeseed oil, which was available because it kind of just falls in line with the general ethos of the restaurant to put as many of those flavors in the forefront as you can in a, in a respectful way. So we use the olive oil in the cake and then we use the olive oil again in a glaze on top. Um, and the oil in the glaze makes a really rich and viscous, shiny glaze for the surface of the cake. And then inside the cake, there's chocolate. And honestly, there's no great 
anecdotal story for why there's chocolate in there other than that it tastes really good and we had it so we just put it in there that was probably the least thought out part of this plan but pretty essential to the recipe at this I point so i would too. say yeah those are still roasting they're probably close to done but then you have to wait for them to cool i don't want to do any of that right now and i happen to have some squash already roasted from yesterday this is that red curry squash See how pretty and orange it is? So you just scoop this out once it's cool enough to handle and you want to puree it and you want about a cup of it to go into this cake. When this recipe was originally published in the Jelena cookbook, Nicole called for draining it overnight in cheesecloth or at least for four hours after you had pureed it. When I talked to her recently, she said she does not do that anymore. So now this recipe can be made all in one day pretty easily. Sorry, this is not very elegant. <laughs> because it's that overnight, the skin is very uh, soggy and fragile. Is there anything you can do to dry it out a bit? <laughs> what, like leave it in the oven too long? Oh. Oh, I see, or drain it. <laughs> So I'm using one of these incredibly handy, incredibly inexpensive mini chopper things. I've done it in a full-size food processor also. That works, but for just a cup of puree, this is actually kind of more efficient. And the blade goes two directions, backwards and forwards. kabocha puree straight from the food processor but before we move on with wet stuff dry stuff okay that is what they look like when they are roasted <laughs> Once you have your roasted and pureed kabocha squash, or in this case, red curry squash, really this is just kind of a dump and stir like any other quick bread, pumpkin bread specifically. So all the dry ingredients are going in to be sifted together here. That was flour, baking powder. I'll tell you what they are, baking soda, A bunch of cinnamon, a tablespoon, some salt, and some nutmeg, which I'm going to freshly grate over here to show you how easy it is to freshly grate your own nutmeg, and I could not recommend it more highly. Buying ground nutmeg just does not have any of the flavor that freshly grated nutmeg has. I mean, it's changed our life. <laughs> it truly has changed my life. Whoa. <laughs> it's not without risk. <laughs> I need two teaspoons, so let's see. I'll check that. And look at that. That's so it's so fluffy. Kind of looks like sawdust, but. <laughs> Can you smell it? No, you can't smell it? Now I can. Yeah, I can smell it a lot. It's it's my favorite spice. But even if it's not your favorite spice, you will be a lot happier if you create it fresh. Okay. All my dry ingredients are in, sifting them together. I'll also say that if you don't have a sifter or a strainer like this, or if you are just kind of not in the mood, if you just whisk these ingredients together, that's also fine. Now wet ingredients. Our kabocha puree, olive oil. A lot of pumpkin breads and similar cakes call for either melted butter or like a vegetable oil, 
sunflower oil, something like that. Olive oil gives it so much more savory flavor. And any oil-based cake is going to keep much better than a butter-based cake. And I'll explain why <laughs> right after I crack these eggs. Quick Wikipedia search later. <laughs> no. I've talked about this in Genius Recipes a number of times. I'm paying attention. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's see what I got. Okay. Oil coats flour much better than butter does. It completely surrounds the flour. And so it inhibits the flour from connecting with the liquid in the recipe and forming extra gluten. Gluten, if you stir too much and make too many gluten chains, can squeeze out water. Meaning that once you bake it, it's, dry, it's driven off more moisture and it will be a drier cake and it will continue to get drier over time. That's why. Oil-based cakes protect the flour, keep from forming excess gluten, and keep your cakes moist for longer. So when you've gone to all this trouble to make a beautiful kabocha cake, roasting your own squash and everything, it will taste just as good on day three or four, maybe even better because like spices have come out all of the flavors have melded and it won't be dry and stale like a lot of butter-based cakes can be. All right, I need to whisk this together. <laughs> Look how nice and smooth that is. It's pretty. Okay, now Nicole says to make a well. I'm gonna make a well now. In my, actually, I'm gonna give this one quick stir to make sure all the spices are uh, friends with all the other things. Okay, there's my well. <laughs> and look at this, there's so much wet compared to dry. That's very exciting, I think. It means that it's going to be a very moist cake. I need to whisk these two things together. Last thing, some chopped chocolate. So this is supposed to be finely chopped, but you don't need to be too intense about it if you like big chunks of chocolate in your pumpkin bread, as I do. Oh, <laughs> just watch out. <laughs> Still have the knife. And just fold this in. That's it. I buttered my loaf pan. Ooh, look at that batter. Okay, right can now. go in now. The oven's at the right temperature. 325 Fahrenheit. That's gonna take a little while. But it'll be worth it. And your house will smell really good. Not like burnt pumpkin seeds anymore. Cake is almost done. Let's make the glaze. This is powdered sugar or confectioner's sugar or icing sugar maybe in the UK. Um, I'm sifting. Oh man, the sifting might take a little while. <laughs> it's coming out in a very fine dust. Whoa, what's gonna happen to that lump? Check it out, Mike. Oh, it just hit again. There it is. Whoa. Here. Yeah. There. We're gonna do some um, forcing with these uh, lumps. This is content. <laughs> if you don't have time for sifting, skip it. The glaze will still be delicious. It might just have a couple lumps in it. Going to get a couple tablespoons of hot water and whisk that in first. And then once that's all whisked in, this is the really genius part about this. This is olive oil. So instead of just being a straightforward punch of sweetness in the glaze, which is also delicious, of course, it has that really savory, amazing flavor that olive oil brings. And it gives it a really nice glossy color as well because you are emulsifying it in. So you whisk it in, uh-oh. <laughs> I should have wrapped a wet towel around this bowl. I'm gonna pause and do that. Slowly whisking in olive oil. It smells really good. 
Make sure you use an olive oil that you really like the flavor of because you will definitely taste it here. The kind of olive oil that you would just dunk bread in and eat straight up. Doesn't have to be expensive, just has to be tasty. That looks like a pretty good drizzling, glazy consistency. I am definitely no expert at making those perfect drips that go down the sides of cake that you see on Instagram, as I'm sure you will see when we start decorating this thing. But that looks like it'll pour pretty nicely over the cake. In addition to this beautiful olive oil glaze, we have some toasted pepitas and cocoa nibs, which if you are not familiar with cocoa nibs, they are just, I believe, oh man, this is gonna be embarrassing. I think they are just the roasted broken up bits of um, the cocoa bean. They have this really deep, slightly bitter chocolate flavor. I find them so delicious and I love putting them on things, especially sweet things to balance them out. She's back. She's back. Okay, that needs to cool for 20 minutes and then we will <laughs> take it out. Stop. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Chaos. That needs to cool for 20 minutes and then I will jimmy it out and it will finish cooling on a rack and then we get to top it. Okay, this has not had its full 20 minutes to cool, but we have to keep going. So do as I say, and as Nicole says, and not as I do. The risk I'm running here is that this cake is still too hot and hasn't finished setting, and it could break apart as I unmold it. <laughs> Which would be very sad because I already burnt the swap. <laughs> okay. You can probably tell. You coming out? Ah! <gasps> oh, it happened. <laughs> it happened. But we, that's why you don't do what I just did. <laughs> but look how good that cake looks. We're gonna patch that back together. <laughs> it's gonna be no problem. Oh. Look at that. Flick my up. <laughs> okay. Oh. oh yeah, food professional. Professional, so hot this cake. Oh. <gasps> Look at that. Oh. Yeah, that's your spoon. Okay, ready? <gasps> you wanna do it like that? Nice. The fun? I'm having fun. <laughs> Do you want to sprinkle some nuts? On top? You want to eat the nuts. Okay, that's cool too. Any for the cake? And then these, cocoa nibs. This is my favorite part, to be honest. Probably good to sprinkle all these things while the glaze is still a little wet, so they'll stick. is a party in a cake. We are going to destroy it. If we don't eat it all today, it will continue tasting great tomorrow and the next day. And you'll be very happy you make it. <laughs> so please make it and let me know what you think. If you want to hear more of my delightful conversation with Nicole, be sure to check out the Genius Recipe Tapes. We will link it in the show notes and it is also available just anywhere that you get your podcast, the Genius Recipe Tapes. Thank you so much. Happy holidays, stay safe, and we will see you in two weeks.